Hello and what? Oh, wait, sorry, wait, 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 wait. Here we go. Hello and welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, your humble host, Charlie the Professore. Professore. And with me, as always, is my right hand man. Uh, don't yeah. ask me what my right hand man does. Uh, I'm very busy. Uh, Phil, fill me in parrot. He is a busy man. He is the he is the founder of Capes and Lunatic, the Capes and Lunatics broadcast channel. Uh, all of the one your one stop shop for everything uh, Cape or Lunatic uh, related in the world of multiple medias. Um, so hey, guess what, Phil? Guess what I recently finished or Uh-oh. finished the first. Oh episode. yeah, your bl- your blog. My blog. Did you read it yet, Phil? Um, no, no, there's no time to read. No, um, I, I, I start, I read some of it. I didn't finish the whole thing yet, but I was very, yeah, intrigued. I told you you didn't read it yet. Uh, no, um, yeah, I'm very excited kids that you're going to see it very soon. And for a little bit of serendipity, a post, uh, on my Facebook, remember when you used to write thing, uh, from three years ago, my, uh, my, my memory, where the MCU fails and how Hawkeye can be saved. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, repost it so you can all read it if you want on my Facebook page. Uh, so anyway, Phil. Uh, any real news this week? Not really. More, uh, you know, Gotham's back, well, which we talked about last night. I was going to say, does it have to be Marvel? Because I was going to say the big news I saw today is they uh, – It'll tie in the Marvel a little bit, but um, the, that DC, uh, that CW DC news we got today, that they, yeah, crossover, the yearly crossover. Oh yeah, will be, will be Crisis on Earth X, which was originally supposed to be Crisis on a Schwastika. Bum bum bum. That's true. They originally wanted to call Earth X Earth Schwastika, and uh, I believe it was Julia Schwartz was the editor at DC. He said, "We're not putting freaking Schwasticas." On the book, um, so it, that's why it's Earth X. It was actually supposed to be Earth Swastika, and you know, because guess what? Swastikas used to be a really controversial thing. Um, people really didn't like to promote, you know, Nazis. Because people kind of really had this interesting understanding about the badness of Nazis. So yeah, so DC did not make it Earth Swastika, even though you know it's about fighting Nazis. You know, it's it's that basic. It was the basic problem they had back in the day uh, with um, uh, they were going to do a Captain America cartoon in I think like the late '80s, early '90s, and um, you know, one of the things that happened with it was that they couldn't use Nazis in it. They could set it in World War II, but they couldn't use Nazis. And this is essentially where they first came up with this idea of. What if the Red Skull ran Hydra and Hydra wasn't per se Nazis? That was the crazy legend. Uh, that was the crazy idea they had. Uh, but you know, it carried it forward to the future. Um, well, well, my whole thought. Well, my whole thought I was thinking is, you know, we're we're just coming out of Secret Empire, and we, you know, we have the, we have the evil Hydra cap, you know, Stevel, and um, mm-hmm. if uh. This is going to be the, you know, DC and Marvel always rip each other off. If this is going to be the case where, uh, you know, coming out of that, if uh, DCW shows were going to give us the uh, evil uh, CW Green Arrow version of uh, Hydra Cap. Well, you know, it would make sense because when you think about it, you know, what's his name? Um, Oliver Queen, you know, he is, he's not necessarily a Nazi fighter by birth, you know. Uh-uh. He's not necessarily a hero by birth. He's, you know, the son of wealth and privilege. And uh, I could see him. If wealth and privilege became tied to membership in the Nazi party, I could see him being a Nazi. I could see that happening. Plus, I mean, uh, if you're, I mean, all these characters are young enough. I mean, if you're born into, like, you know, a Nazi regime, I mean, you wouldn't know the difference. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that and, you know, for what it's worth, there's all kinds of crazy there's so many like crazed stories about people who, you know, try to eke out domesticity in 
within fascism. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, it was an HBO, I think it was called Fatherland, which was sort of like about like the Nazis actually like sue for peace. And so the Nazis actually continue on and you wind up with this guy who's like this, he's a Gestapo agent, but like now the Gestapo is just kind of like the domestic FBI. And like during the war, he was on a submarine hmm. and like, he knows all of the propaganda, but he doesn't really like feel it. Cause you know, we still have to feel he's a good guy and no one knows about what happened with the concentration camps. Like everyone, it's just like, Oh, you know, just that, I think most people forget about the 40s is like, you know, there was a real base level of racism that was pervasive throughout the world, you know, which is why America really had no problem sending, you know, boatloads of Jews back when they came to America seeking refugee status. Because, you know, hey, why do we want all those people here, they said. They're with their foreign ways and strange customs. What if they're terrorists, we said. Just because we have the sign out front in, in, in uh, Ellis Island, hey. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, yeah, that's 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 the thing. America is a country that has great ideals to which they do not always live up. Though in truth, we only don't live up to our, our ideals because unlike every other country, we actually have ideals. So that is that is why I will love America forever because I do think we are a country that has ideals, you know, and that we don't live up to our ideals less about the fact that we are bad, but more about the fact that we feel bad about the fact that we don't live up to our ideals. At least that, that, that's my rationalization for it. <laughs> but yeah, it would be very interesting to see, um, to see our, our Nazi era, you know, our, um, don't know how Mr. Terrific works into all that. But, uh, you know, it will be interesting to see what happens. But, you know, we're going to get Legends of Tomorrow and uh, all these guys. And, of course, Stein, he, he ain't going to be cutting into that. And, obviously, neither is the is uh, Dax. So, uh, is, Dax is his name, right? Jax. Jax, Jax. I'm calling him Dax. I'm thinking Jadzia Dax. Got Star Trek on the brain. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's going to be exciting. Um, so, you know, along those same lines, there is an interesting controversy. Again, it's the Nazi episode, kids, so uh, mark it in your notebooks. Uh, Rose City Comic Con took a bold stance on cosplay. Did you read about this, Phil? Oh, yeah, the, the people, I mean, they... It's about, you know, they don't want, like, uh, hate images. So you're not allowed to dress like, what, the Red Skull or any Hydra agent? Yeah, they don't want Red Skull, Hydra, or Nazi-inspired characters or Nazi parody characters. So you can't be Captain Hydra this year at Rose City Comic Con. And it's a very interesting thing, you know, because I'm not sure how I feel about that. Because I do, you know, because here's what I'll say. I don't know if Nazis are worse than the Joker. You know, I, I, I don't know that. And I'm not going to say, you know, obviously Nazis are real. But the Red Skull isn't, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's this very, I think it's a much more complex question. But given the fact that there is this effort afoot in the fanboy community to sort of press for superheroes as a symbol of hate. You know, I think it, it, it goes into this weird spot, you know? There are so many people right now who who liked Captain Hydra unironically, you know? Mm -hmm. There are too many people out there who, for whom that white male ideal of superheroes is a little too important to them. And I can see how they how it's easy to fear the idea that the comic book and cosplay community could become a safe space for people who reject 
um, the ideals that we ascribe, well, that other people ascribe to superheroes. It, it's just like a, a tricky balance of like, you know, you want a free space for people, but, you know, you also, there's also freedom of speech. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a tricky balance. And once again, I mean, a con is a business. So they want people to feel yeah. safe. So they'll come and spend money. Well, exactly. And, and you know what? I, I think this is a classic Pepe the Frog situation. I think no one cared that you did a Red Skull cosplay. You know, when Captain America First Avenger came out, if you did a Red Skull cosplay, you stood right next to the person doing the, um, uh, who was that guy with the red face from Star Wars? Oh, uh, Darth Maul. Darth Maul, doing the Darth Maul cosplay, you know, mm-hmm. you know, separated at birth jokes, you know, I mean, that's, that that's what it is, you know, it, it's this idea that, you know, you know, it's like, you know, if the Red Skull and the Cenobite had a baby, It'd be Darth Maul. Um, and that is, I think that is a thing where you can have an honest cosplay of it. But you have this problem where when people of certain groups associate themselves with it, it does become far more problematic. You know, and I, I do think about this with regard to the Confederate flag a lot. Now, while I do understand that the resurgence of the Confederate flag does come from a act of cultural oppression. I also know that it existed in a naive in a naive way as just a as just a symbol of F U to authority. You know, which of course is what it was, but it's sort of this question about saying F U to authority and what is the authority we're effing uh, and who is the you who's getting aft? Um, so I think when 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 I was a kid and Bowen Duke, Bowen Luke Duke had the Confederate flag on the General Lee, I don't think anyone particularly thought about it in those terms, except for those people for whom it was a triggering either positive or negative for them to see it. So for those who saw that Confederate flag and knew too many people with that Confederate flag painted on their car who were racists and took either joy or fear in seeing it, you know, that's the, that, that was where it got to be a problem. Now, as a person today, even though I loved the Duke boys as a kid, <laughs> You know, Bowen Luke, not Vance and Coy. Yeah. Vance and Coy, you are not Duke boys. They're the Shemp. Nobody likes you. Yeah. Actually, Shemp predates Curly. Shemp was actually the original third stooge, but he he was a he had a fear of success, you know. Um, that's why they went back and got Curly, uh, according to the movie I once saw. On He's the a, he, um, he was he was the Pete Best. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, actually, Shemp was actually the. Shemp actually had like success as a solo act, mm-hmm. which is also why he didn't want to necessarily be in the Three Stooges because he actually was kind of a known. I mean, he was coming up, and it was like, eh, do I want to go back and hang with my brother and his idiot friend? You know, <laughs> I don't mind pulling him up, but then of course, you know, his brother and his idiot friend and his other brother wanted to be get, getting to be the big stars, and then when you know, when sadly. Uh, Curly had his uh, stroke, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had to bring in Shemp, you know. And man, those guys they had hard lives. But yeah, no. Um, I think there was an innocence to it, and I think there was an innocence to it that extended beyond race. I think there were a lot of young kids, and even adults who knew, you know, when certain symbols are ubiquitous. And, th- and this is what this is what I think you have to understand. When a symbol is ubiquitous, like the Confederate flag in the 70s and 80s, it starts to lose its negative connotation. Because you will see folks who are just decent folks who just happen to, you know, want to have, you know, there's actually there's a there's a bucket gang called the Chinolings in uh, New York City. Um and they, they're legend, their story, again, according to a documentary I once saw, said that Chingaling means F the world. 
Nazi paraphernalia. Now, mind you, these are like, this is mostly a Hispanic uh, biker gang. And they say, well, we, we're Nazi paraphernalia because Nazis were the, were the worst people ever. And it really freaks people out to see you wearing it. So that's because we want to be like, that. we want people to just be freaked out when they see me, you know? And so I get that idea of adopting that I, iconography for even subverting that kind of iconography so that it becomes much more about rebellion than about what the rebellion was actually about. Much more about saying, I'm an evil monster rather than saying, I'm an evil monster who does this. But what happens is, is that when these things, when, when these symbols get too strongly defended by those who are of that evil monster group. Suddenly it's like, well, now I can't defend it, you know? Mm -hmm. When it's just the good old boys never meaning no harm who want to have a Confederate flag, I can say, hey, they're just good old boys. They ain't meaning no harm. You know, it's all you never saw. They've been in trouble with the law since the day they were born. Um, you know, I, I can I can understand that. But when someone says, yeah, but you do know it's super racist. And you go, oh, yeah, I guess it kind of is. And then everyone else says, okay, well, you know what? I'm just a good old boy. I'm not meaning no harm. And if it's really harming you, I'm going to stop doing it. You know, if it really harms you, to do it. I don't need a freaking Confederate flag on my car. You're right. I can put, you know, I can put the American flag up there. You to the British. So F you, British. <laughs> we all hate those limey bastards, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the thing. Is like There's many ways that you can express rebellion that isn't being hateful to people. And when other people say, no, 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 I have to have the hateful way to express rebellion, it kind of makes you think, well, I think it's not so much about you rebelling, it's about you wanting to be hateful. And I think that's that's when we have to say, okay, I guess I guess we don't get to have Confederate flags anymore because you because because you ruined it, Nazis. You ruined it. You know, we can't have statues to Robert E. Lee anymore because you ruined it. You know, if it was just some guy on a horse, no one would care. But because you had to say, well, we're the Nazis and we say we need to keep these statues alive, it's like, well, now we can't defend them. We actually probably could have defended them, and we probably did. Lots of people defended these things for decades. That's the thing you got to understand. For decades, people defended this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's heritage. It's it's a culture. It's it's part of our history. And you know, Robert E. Lee was a great general, and you know, and Stonewall Jackson was a great general, and they were great generals. And if you want to build an icon to a great general, I guess they're not so bad, you know. Um, you know, one could argue that Osama bin Laden was a great general, too. We're not building any shrines to him right now. And that is why it gets to be, that is why it gets to be a little rough, you know, because essentially you, when you start saying, well, maybe we should have with, you know, a statue to the slaves who were oppressed and remember that history. And then people get all mad. And it's like, well, maybe it's not really about history for you, is it? It's about the history you want to remember and the history you want to forget. I just, I don't understand the whole concept of statues. I mean, unless it's like art, I mean, just like, just representations in stone or, or metal of like real people. It just, uh, uh, it just seems weird to me. <laughs> yeah. But you know what, if there was a Nightwing statue in, in Times well, Square, you know you would go to that. If if DC but, but, like but, TV Land yeah. commissioned all the bronze statues of yeah. TV guys, if DC and Marvel started putting up those heroic statues around the country, you would start doing pilgrimages and you know but, you would go. That that's my point. You can kind you can consider that art because those aren't real people, those are fictional characters. Yeah, but you know, I mean the fact of the matter is is that you know you want I mean I'd go. I I'd go to the Jefferson Memorial where there's a statue of him. I'd go to the Lincoln Memorial. They're real people, but they're still cool people. Yeah. You know, 
and honestly, if you want to put up a statue to Robert E. Lee, that in and of itself is less controversial to me than Our- you know, if all right, you, it, all right, you know, all right, wait, let me, then, then the context around it. All right, let's play. That, that's the context around it is what makes it a problem. All right, let me play devil's advocate for a second. Okay, what is the difference between a Robert E. Lee statue and a Thomas Jefferson? I mean, Thomas Jefferson, yeah, did a lot of good things, but he owned slaves. Yeah, well, the difference is, is that Thomas Jefferson didn't fight, a, although ironically enough, technically he did fight a war to maintain slavery. Um, which is what the American Revolution was about, but you know it wasn't a, the 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 desire to maintain slaves in the United States was not a central theme of the American Revolution, um, whereas it was literally the only theme of the Confederate Revolution. Mm-hmm. So when the Confederates uh, rebelled against the United States and uh, tried to form their own less perfect disunion. Uh, And America, you know, said, not so fast, bitches, and uh, smacked them down hard. You know, that's the difference. That is the literal difference, is that Jefferson owned slaves, but didn't fight to say, we must be a slave nation. Mm -hmm. You know, even though we wound up being a slave nation, I don't even think in the Articles of Confederation slavery played that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. I think that slavery really got its codification when we got to... um, Because the Articles of Confederation were were a much weaker document as far as representation and things like that. How do you always drag me down this path? Politics or... (laughs) Uh, Honestly, man, it's not me. It's Rose City Comic Con. I know. And you're the one that started it with Earth X, you know? We're going to go visit the Nazis. You know, we're going to go... I just thought it was a cool storyline and Barry and Iris are getting married. Oh yeah. Hey, you know, you did that art piece and they have the flash and then they had Barry in the foreground. I saw that. That's what I was going to say, but Hey, fastest man alive Two places. He looks like he could do two places. He he can appear in two places at once. (laughs) It doesn't really work that way. You know, because it's symbolic. I mean, the man could play ping pong with himself. Come on. I can play ping pong with myself. You just flip the other side of the board up. Charlie, this isn't a euphemism. It's real. <laughs> I'm talking about ping pong. Uh, anyway. Anyway, um, did you read uh, this week's Generations, Miss Marvel, Miss Marvel? No, no, I, I didn't. Another another uh, plot point, proving your uh, whole timeline theory. Uh, mm-hmm. Kamala, Kamala shows up uh, in the past, like she hits the ground and goes, oh, does anyone have any ibuprofen? And some guy on the street goes, ibu what? Mm, yeah, well, because it's in the past. There was no uh-huh. ibuprofen back then. Uh-huh. All you had was delicious cyanide laced Tylenol. They're dropping those hints, man. Oh, oh, I'm telling you, man. I know you. You heard you. You heard me and David Walker when I. I totally knew what he was doing, man. I was in your head, you comic book writers. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's uh. Yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing, you know. I mean, and I do think that's that that is a great thing about the generations idea. No, I was I was debating it, man. But it, you know, it's like money is like in that spot. It's like, yeah. you know. But I guess I, don't, I guess they're I don't know if they're uh, Russian. I no, sorry, they're, I, I was. The, I'm sorry, I was gonna say I don't know if they're Russian to get generations done since Marvel Legacy comes out next week because they I guess the last mm-hmm. I, I guess it's the last two issues of. Uh, Generations comes out next week because it's the Spider-Man one and the Captain America one both next week. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, they got to get it done because these are all one shots. So you know, then we got the yeah. legacy coming. So you well, know, they, I mean, they, so far they've been doing one a week. So I'm guessing they're just yeah. like, okay, okay, end of the month, legacy's coming out. Let's get those last two out. Yeah, well, because those are your big finale ones. You know, I'm yeah. not, and obviously Captain America, Cap and Cap. Mm-hmm. You know, Sam Wilson and Captain America. Because something in there really plays out why Falcon isn't Captain America anymore. Oh, well, did you read Avengers this week? No, I didn't, actually. Oh, because he has a big talk with uh, Jane Foster because, you know, he's not Cap. He's already in that new Falcon suit. And he's like, he's like, I need you to lead the Avengers because, you know, I guess the whole point was he was thinking, you know, people aren't going to follow me if I'm not wearing this 
stars and stripes. And she's like, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> yeah. Huh? I'm sorry, you fell out there on whatever that last word you said uh, was. Oh, she said, what are you, an idiot? She's like, you know, these Avengers are going to follow you no matter what suit you're wearing. And he's like, well, mine is high profile. and I'm not the most high profile uh, member anymore. And she's like, Spider-Man's always been our most high profile member. <laughs> yes and he wasn't even a member but um, um yeah i mean it starts with them going back to uh well the baxter building and you know parker industries is gone thank you Otto. uh and they're you know the first couple of pages pages are just them going peter parker's a jerk i'm like oh charlie's gonna love this issue yes does pete have to move back in with that may uh i don't well they haven't shown yet but i don't think uh, you watch. He's gonna he's gonna show up at Aunt May's house with uh John with like Jameson the first, and they're gonna be like, you know, Pete, I really don't have a lot of room in the house anymore. <laughs> and, you, know, you live in a mansion, Aunt. Don't you got like eighteen rooms here, guy? Just crashing one. Like you know, it's like you know, me and yeah, and I just want Aunt May to have a little shit suit in this line. Um. Oh goodness. Uh. Yeah. Um. You know. I, I really haven't gotten. You know. I haven't even read the last two generations. I. I I'm like falling behind them on comic books now. That I don't review them all the time. And it's really bugging me because it's like ah, oh, I hate that feeling. I liked when we did comic book reviews and I had to have them in. And now, now I'm just another lazy student not reading his his homework assignments. Should 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 I should I force you? Should I say, hey, we're gonna discuss them either on super connectivity or capes and lunatics this week? So get them read. No. Is there is, is there just is there just too much content? Is there too much material now between the comics and the TV shows and movies? Is it is it just an over, up, overabundance? Real life now, Phil. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying, but it but there's there's so much content now. Not even just like superheroes, but just like you know. Yeah, there's a lot of content, and yeah, that takes you, up a lot you, of time. You were, you were, you were, I got to watch the shows and do the podcast on the shows, and and Gotham was on last night. We did our special. Uh... But you know, you know what the problem is, what? is that I think that there are a lot of books that I get more casual about, like Superman. You know, I have not read. Any of my Superman. I mean, really, if you count the issues that I half read, it was like, ugh, Superman, I don't care about American history. Eat a fruit pie. Um, you know, if you count those books, I'm like at five books now that I haven't really read of Superman. And I'm like, you know, I'll read them out of obligation, but do I really want to get a sixth book, you know, in two weeks? You know, it's and this is what always happens with me with DC. I get very excited about a character for them and I read them for a while. And then it's just like the stories don't grab me. Now, New Superman, I'm still into. Um, and are you because I do think Red he's Hood. doing something different? I'm and sorry, Red what Hood. and Red Hood? Uh, I mean, I, Red Hood hasn't gotten on the poll yet, pull list yet. Uh, Phil, don't get cocky. Uh, oh. <laughs> We have to see how Flowers for Bizarro uh, plays out. Because not for nothing, if Flowers for Bizarro just winds up being Flowers for Bizarro, it's not going to be that interesting. They at least need to do Flowers for Rhino. Still, in my opinion, one of the best single comic book issues ever made. Hmm. Did you ever read Flowers for Rhino? Uh, I don't know if I did. It was... It was, oh, it was, they did a series of Spider-Man stories that were, like, focused on all of his villains, and they were, like, all a bunch of, like, one or two issue things. I don't know if Flower Serrano was one issue or two. But basically, you know, it's basically Rhino feeling very, and this is the original Rhino, feeling very depressed mm-hmm. as he always is. Sen- ever since they did that um, thing Rhino issue where Rhino is being taken out of Project Pegasus because he's, you know... He just wants them to cure him, that he's a willing participant. And then, like, uh, this was actually the first appearance of Scourge because mm-hmm. Mr. Miracle shows up and, um, it, you know, busts him out. And 
you know, there's this whole thing that, and basically the very end of it is like just um, Rhino falling down to his knees and crying and sobbing because he knows they're not going to cure him now. They're not going to even try because he's too great a risk because Mr. Miracle screwed it up because um, Rhino was being good. He was trying to get his good behavior so he could get some super scientists to freaking take the Rhino skin off. And um, which is why I hate like freaking battle armor Rhino. Because it like ruins mm. Rhino. The whole point of Rhino is he got this great power at an amazing cost, which is he lost his humanity. He's basically the thing, but he's still got a human face. Um, and what what is um, and then and so when Flowers for Rhino, you basically have the same idea. He's feeling very sorry for himself and very sad. Super scientist, evil doctors who are like. We're like, dude, we can't take off your skin. You know, uh, you know, it just it would be easier to do anything to you other than so, so you said, let me give me laser eyes. I'm like, sure, I'll give you laser eyes tomorrow, Rhino. Yep. I can't take off your skin. And then he sees they're doing these experiments. And they've got this monkey there who's like a you know, who's got this intelligence boost. You know, and he's like, you know, and he's like, look. Okay, you can't do that. Give me what you did to the monkey. And they're like, well, it's going to be hard cutting into your brain. He says, that's okay. <laughs> I ain't using it much. That's the whole point. <laughs> and so they cut into his brain, and they do the thing, and suddenly he starts getting smarter. And it's really about him becoming smarter and smarter until he is the smartest being in, in the world, winds up taking over all of organized crime. He has figured out every super villains, uh, every superhero secret identity, because he created a, an algorithm to figure it out. And it's like, you know, j- just basic, you know, hand waving him for everything he does. But it's, and then it becomes about how he gets separated from humanity. And it like starts out with how much he loves this, this, this mob, mob guy's daughter named Stella, who, of course, when it starts out, she's very in, she she is very smart and he is very dumb. But as it changes, you get that perspective shift where he gets smarter and she gets more and more just some girl from Brooklyn, you know. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, he can't be with her, and then he starts to realize how empty his life is because he's so intelligent. And they sort of foreshadow this with the monkey because the monkey winds up hanging himself in his cell. Um, because he just got so smart, he couldn't connect with anything on a human level. And he's about to kill himself when suddenly he gets smart enough to realize, oh, wait, I know how to reverse it. (laughs) Because the scientists were saying, oh, we have no idea how we could reverse it. That's the problem. Once you do it, it's done forever. And so he writes it down for them. And and at the very end, it's this great joke. He says, says, wait, before you do this, make me just a little bit dumber. So I don't do this again. <laughs> um, no, Flowers for Rhino was a great take on the Flowers for Algernon story. Um, it, it's really beautiful. I highly recommend anyone read it. Google Flowers for Rhino. It'll tell you what's, what issues it's in. And it's a great story. And so they're doing Flowers for Algernon with, they're doing Flowers for Bizarro. And the problem is, is that Okay, we've already seen Flowers for Algernon. We've already read Flowers for Rhino. How do you tell this story again without having it just be, and it's Flowers for Algernon, but with Bizarro, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think what they may do is they may have a bit more uh, human goodness involved in it for um, Rhino. He is, you know, because he is Superman, there's going to be this issue. What I assume is going to be the issue is that he knows he's going to lose this. That's how much good can I do before I lose what I am? And of course, what I think the curveball at the end is, is he's going to realize I don't have to be a genius to do good, you know? And I was never as dumb as I think I was, you know, that, I was, people saw me, uh, so basically, I'm guessing that that'll be the take. It's going to be this um, other other way, uh, other modes of intelligence 
uh, view of intelligence, sort of like there is the classical supervillain, super scientist intelligence, but that that capacity was always in him, but no one assumed it because of the way he talked and the way he behaved and the way he acted in the same way that, you know, who, you know, suffer from autism, maybe depending on what society they're in, get judged harshly and no one realizes the intellect inside them. Expression is not what you think about it. And you think about it, we see that every day in the way we treat people with accents. You know, mm-hmm. someone has a bad, if someone has a hillbilly accent and you think negatively about him, doesn't matter if he's got a degree in physics, he sounds like a hillbilly. Mm-hmm. Or you're Ben Grimm, you know, you've got your master's in uh, in uh, astronomical engineering, uh, no one cares because they just think you're the dumb guy from Brooklyn. Oof. So that's how they can tell that story, and it'll be interesting. So we'll see how they do it. We'll see if they if they do what I think they should do, and if they don't, then it'll be awful, and I'll stop reading. So, <laughs> so you haven't took a big risk with this. So you didn't read anything this week. You didn't do your homework I gave you last night to read yeah. all new Guardians of the Galaxy. No, I didn't. No, no, I oh. read all my books this week. Yeah, you'll uh, except for Superman. That's all I didn't read yeah. this week. But no, I yeah. haven't read Guardians of the Galaxy yet because that's not yeah. one of my books. I, I actually yeah. have to re-download the Marvel app mm-hmm. so I can read that. But um, oh, spo- okay, spoilers. I I have to discuss this with you. Spoilers, <laughs> everyone. Three, mm-hmm. two, one. Okay. Um. So they got you know the grandmaster the grandmaster and the collector have been like back and forth using the guardians mm-hmm. against each other and the grandmaster says you know i was just testing you brother he's like the universe has changed did you feel it it happened in a blink our reality underwent a reordering on a grand scale in secret and almost without any evidence nearly everything is the same but it's all different now and i don't know what to trust anymore mm-hmm. uh I thought the best way to test you after the redesign of this existence was attempt to mistreat your precious collection. They say, no, I use the uh, guardians as pawns and they're like, the contemplator has no head <laughs> and the gardener is missing. Although they say uh, by the end of the issue, they show Wait, the he, contemplator. Like, so it's the contemplator's body, but no head now, I guess. Yeah. But it used to be just the head, no body. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I guess the, the they're saying even the the um the elders of the universe they're like they're they're like they're worried. <laughs> yeah, and, I understand why. And the infinity stones are all missing. Uh, and that's when they give them a, a, a history lesson on the stones. Uh, who is it? The collector, I think, was saying the stones must still still exist because we still exist. Our universe is a complicated simulation, one of many, all side by side. Each universe is but a thread in the fabric of a singular tapestry. The infinity stones are the representation of what you would call a computer code with the source code. You can reprogram the reality around us, even traverse different realities. The soul stone is quite unique among them. It is not just code, but in fact, what you would call a hard drive, a vast, possibly limitless storage device for information. But what happens to information when it passes through the soul stone? And he's, he's like in, he's in Star Lord's head. He's like, it's all connected. But they, so they're like, I guess the guardians are going to like, supposed to hunt down the infinity stones. But they're like, well, I guess they say, you know, Thanos has disappeared. And they're like, well, what if that's Thanos' whole plan? He waits for us to gather the stones and then try to steal them from us. Yeah. Oh, Thanos. But then they show, you know, they said the gardener was missing, but he's the one who's been messing with uh, Groot. You know, he's the reason Groot can't, hasn't been growing. But who put who put this whole idea in uh, the gardener's head? Who? Your old buddy, your old buddy Loki. Oh, good old Loki. He's always in people's heads. He's he's telling me you now all these meat creatures, you know, always are destroying your work, and the world tree is unwell. It's overrun with parasites. You know, these disgusting humans and. So that's Loki. our Loki. Uh-huh. He is the greatest villain in the Marvel Universe. Like I, said, <laughs> I don't know why everyone's like, oh, the only good villain is Hiddleston. It's like, yes, and he is great at it, you know? It's like mm-hmm. you don't need any extra villains. He does the job, you know, from him whispering in the Red Skull's ears, headcanon in 1940 to say, 
No, there's a tesseract over there. Go get a tesseract. Go find it, you know. Then Zola, Zola, here's how you open the dang thing. Open that up, okay? Good Zola, good Zola. You know, Loki's been playing this long game because he's immortal, you know? Mm -hmm. And totally played uh, freaking Thanos. I mean, Thanos is, I mean, I, that's the thing for me. It's like, I don't understand. I will never under, I never understood why Darkseid was supposed to be like a bad guy. I mean, you know, I never really, I mean, I mean, I know he's a bad guy. But well, I, I mean. Really realized like, why is he like horror? I mean, like, wh why is he, why are we supposed to be, Darkseid to me is like Blastar. He's very powerful, I guess. And kind of weird looking. Well, people's, people kind of get nervous around you when you start coming up with anti-life equations. Yeah, but I mean, I guess so. But it's not like it's ever worked, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but all, it, only takes, it only takes one time, yeah. Yeah, except it didn't work that time because eventually they just... But now we'll just reverse the... Or whatever they did. Reverse the... the they re they reversed the curse spell. They had you know Samantha Wheeler knows the opposite direction and that fixed the whole problem. Thanks to the Brown Hornets' amazing powers, they naturally escaped unharmed. You know, I mean that's the thing. And and for what it's worth, I guess like a person on Earth actually created the life the anti life serum or what was it like billion billion like dollar bill or uh, the guy there was there's a character. I don't know. I read it on Wikipedia once. Um, you know, uh, and it's basically just a mind control spell. The life equation. It's just a mind control spell. It just hmm. saps you of your will. Uh, sort of like, you know, freaking ringmaster. The lowest form of super villainy. Okay, purple man. Um, <laughs> we're so impressed by you. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's I you know guys that are like just supposed to be like the big bads like that that aren't particular particularly manipulative because mm -hmm. that's the, you don't think about Darkseid as like the great manipulator. You don't think about him from the shadows pulling strings. No, you think about him showing up and punching something or shooting you with radium eyes. You know, it's like okay, and that's the same thing I think with Thanos. I never, you know, I don't feel about Thanos the way I feel about Loki. You know, Loki clearly is a guy who's whispering in ears, you know? Loki is clearly a guy pulling strings. Lex Luthor pulls strings. Dr. Doom pulls strings sometimes, you know? Um, the Kingpin is all about the strings. Nick Fury is all about the strings. Hydra Cap was all about the strings. Oh, that's... Those oh, are scary villains. Oh, oh, that's the other thing. Spider-Man Spider 2, they came up with the origin for the, you know, remember there was like a Miles Morales from the origi originally from the 616. He's like an older guy. And he's like... Oh, there is now. Well, well yeah. Well they, were, well, they revealed his... They kind of started revealing his origin in that issue. Guess who he is? he's been friends with for many, many years? Otto Octavius. No, Willie Fisk. Norman Osborn. Oh, Willie Wilson Fisk. Okay. Yeah, they, they've been in prison. He's yeah. a jovial sort. You know, I could see being friends with Wilson Fisk, you know. Well, they, well, they met in prison, and he kind of saved uh, Fisk's life, so uh, it helped him take over the mob when he got out. Yeah. So there we go. So so the Miles Morales of the 616 is actually a villain. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, well, they're probably going <laughs> to make him, like, a tragic figure because, like, eventually he wanted out, the, like, he wanted to be with yeah. this woman, but I don't know if, that, uh, if that's going to last. If, it lasted. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't know why they had to do like a weird retconned origin of six one six Miles Morales. Well, they never showed who who you know who or what they uh, the, a six because at the end of the first Spider Man series, after Peter Parker went to the Ultimate Universe and met Miles, he comes back and is like, "Oh, let me see if there's a Miles Morales in this universe," and they just showed his face going. <gasps> But they never showed what it was. So Bendis, yeah. so Bendis, Bendis had to uh, come up with something. Shocking. Yeah, ah, Bendis. Well, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a story, I guess. I mean, you know what? I mean, you know what? I get that way, but you know, it's, 
here's the thing. When I say what I say about DC, I, it's the same way I am about, uh, there's a lot of Marvel characters like that, where every so often I'll start reading them. Like Spider-Man. And I would read Spider-Man, and then it's just like, why am I reading Spider-Man? What is the what is the attraction of this character? You know, aside from the fact that he's bad at his job, like Ambush Bug is bad at his job, but at least Ambush Bug is funny about it. <laughs> you know, um, he's he, that's he's supposed to be the everyman. He's, 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 he's not the like everyman. Every the everyman actually works for a living. You know who an everyman superhero would be. You know, you know who the Everyman superhero was? Who? The Everyman superhero was the original Human Torch. <clears throat> because he became a cop. Mm. He said, I have great powers. That means I have great responsibility. So I should utilize this great power in a responsible way and join law enforcement. You know? That's what he did. That's what you do when you have superpowers in a universe. You don't take the law into you, your own hands. You take them to court. As uh, not Judge Wapner, but the announcer guy would say. Um, you know, you don't take the law into your own hands. You take them to court. You know, that's our system. And, you know, that's the thing, man. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, you know, so no, Peter Parker's not an everyman. Peter Parker is a kid who fell bass backwards into superpowers and just tried to find a way to make money off the deal. Even when he decided, I got to be a superhero, I guess, he's still trying to make money off of it by selling pictures of himself to J. Jonah Jameson. He is never not trying to profit off of his powers. Even Parker Industries is based on the idea of I supply technology to Spider-Man who is going to keep us safe, whether it's through Otto or through Peter. It's still about how can I make money off of these powers? It's never about great power having great responsibility. It's how can I get minds? And that's that, that menace Spider-Man. Also known as Peter Parker. Oh, look at this. I, I just pulled up on uh, the internet. It's coming up in Peter Parker, the spectacular Spider-Man. Spider-Man and Jameson are going all, it says, the headline says they're going all Frost Nixon. Oh, yeah. That would be interesting. They said something big. You realize, in that, you realize in that, that means that Spider-Man's Nixon, right? I am not a crook. <laughs> Yeah, he's a menace, though. I am not a menace. <laughs> um, but here's what I'm going to say. There's a, there was actually an interesting fan theory I read recently that suggested that um, Jameson was actually a secret promoter of Spider-Man because he is a reporter, and so he should be able to... It's basically the idea is like, well, Lois Lane must know that Superman's Clark Kent because she's a reporter, and, you know, they're not that stupid. Um... Uh, and um, and the idea is is that yeah, so that'd be interesting to reveal that yeah, Jameson always knew Peter Parker was Spider Man, at least suspect it. Um, he kept Peter Parker around and kept Spider Man in the news to help him in his thing, even though he always sold it as you know Spider Man's a menace. He knew that Spider Man was actually going to do good. And by calling him a menace, it forced Spider-Man to have to... Ooh, there's a good story. There's a great story. So, before Spider-Man becomes a superhero, he starts out as a celebrity. Hmm. He's doing talk shows. He's doing his gig. And suddenly he says, oh, well, now I'm a superhero. And Jameson realizes maybe he is going to be a superhero, but he's only going to be a superhero if I always remind him what a freaking loser he is. And so he keeps on reporting about, you know, this guy's he's a self-aggrandizing nabob of negativism, you know. He's not doing this for the good of anyone. He's just trying to enrich himself. And that is why Peter Parker doesn't do that. Because 
even more than Uncle Ben, J. Jonah Jameson was the one who reminded him, you can't use this power for yourself. You know, you want to swing around, you got to make sure you're being selfless and the most righteous man alive if you're going to do that. Poor Jameson, if that's the case, what's his reward? He gets webbed to his office chair every so often. Sometimes you got to suffer to endure. He's a martyr, you know? He's He must endure this in order to make Spider-Man be the hero he needs to be, the hero New York needs. Because if if he ever let up, Peter would immediately, immediately go back to being uh, the the villain that he always wanted to be, you know? That's, that auto let him be. Your theory might... Might might be true because I mean they showed what was I think it was in this week's spectacular Spider Man yeah Jameson starting a blog now he's on at the bugle he has a blog he has a blog yeah because that's the future <laughs> me and Jameson that's uh, right <laughs> oh wait I have I have, I have to find this it had some kind of you know trying to be cute oh oh no there was the headline because he was ta- he was ripping on spider-man a arachnid a arachnid oh goodness <laughs> <sighs> i'll say this much though uh if that's his blog he's got a great web designer you know yeah well he has money doesn't he i don't know if he does he did. Well, he was the mayor of New York for a while. I mean, I thought he had some money, but then he was the mayor of New York. He should. You only yes. make money as a politician if you're crooked. And he's not crooked. That's the thing. You know? Uh, if he was crooked, sure, he'd be rich for days. But he ain't crooked. That's the problem. So you don't think you he, know? Made, he, he didn't make any money as like the uh, at the Bugle back in the day? Oh, he made money at Bugle and Bugle Media, but he had to divest himself from that when he became um, mm, mayor. mayor. Um, his dad still got money, but he but his dad invested all that stuff in that quack startup Parker Industries. Well, his dad's dead, so I wonder if he, I'm trying to remember if he got an inheritance. He probably got some kind of. Well, he might have gotten something. Well, except except that you know it all got it was all tied up in Parker Industries stock. Yeah, well, he had probably yeah, split from the bank. <laughs> Oh, Jameson. Yeah, I don't know how big Beagle Media is in the in the six one six. It's like in in like certain versions of the universe, it's like as big as CNN, and uh, he is like you know freaking uh, Rod, not Roger Ailes, uh, Murdoch and uh, Ted Turner combined. You know, um, and then in other universes, you know, he just he's running a failing paper. You know? <laughs> And like all, and like all rich people in comic books, you know his his fortunes, uh, you know, sway with the tides. Ah, oh. oh goodness, yeah. So that's my theory: is that certainly uh, J. Jonah Jameson will reveal. Of course, I always knew you were Spider Man Parker, and I still think you're a loser. Ooh. And I still think that the second the pressure's off, you're going to go back to being that guy, that, that pro wrestler that you used to be. Cause I know, cause I would, and he's going to say, I, you know, you know what, Peter, I remember, you know, when we first met, he's going to say, yeah, when I came to the people that they says, no, Peter, I met you at Madison square garden on da, 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 when hmm. you beat hacksaw, you know, and I saw you there jumping around. And I said, who is this, uh, this crazy punk? He's doing all this and he's, gonna you know he's using that power just to make some money you know and i remember watching you as you were going on tv inspiring crazy kids to build sonic vibro things that get them in trouble get them arrested that retcon kid you know what's his name shocker no not shocker they, when they did uh, when they retold the origin of, of spider-man again they gave him like this villain who like was inspired by Spider Man because he was watching Spider Man at some event. Oh, 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 yeah. Um, uh, was that is that Clash? I forget his name. Yeah, yeah, Clash. That's it. Because he was the yeah. one that they came back with just before 
Yeah, yeah. Whatever that last thing was, you know, because he was working at Power Parker Industries and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, you know, and like, and you're going to find out that maybe Jameson knew all along and just said, you know what, if any, if you ever, if people weren't always making you be a hero, you would be the greatest villain there was. Hmm. Just like that, 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 that Captain America guy. And that's next season. That's next summer's special. Reign of the Spider Man. I don't know. They said they're 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 staying away from big events, Marvel, for the foreseeable oh, future. Man. I mean, they're doing like mini. They they might do mini events and through some of the books, but mm. all the books are going to be their own event. No no big. Every uh, book's an event. That's that's what they said. Yeah, that's what they said. Well, we'll see what they do. Um. But no, but you know, but that's the thing is like if Spider Man didn't have to buy Aunt May heart medication, he'd be freaking down to club. He's getting some love, you know? Like dancing like in Spider Man 3. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> Spider Man Tango. Best Spider Man dancing ever. What is us? Uh, what is it with you in the third one of every movie <laughs> superman 3 spider-man 3 no two was the better uh spider-man film oh yeah you know the auto story was fantastic oh, of course auto. Spider-Man yeah 3 was, spider-man 3 was too busy um they didn't need to have a hobgoblin and they didn't need to like do a redemption arc for freaking sandman that first movie right. i was doing it to save my sick kid it's like really can't you just be a villain with superpowers? Is that so and what, hard? And what, he's the one who killed Uncle Ben or he was there? It's like, oh, God. No, he, he, he winds up being the guy who killed Uncle Ben, which means that his whole harassment of that poor guy who didn't kill Uncle Ben is now meaningless. It's like, And that, to me, is kind of like, you know, trying to make the Joker yeah. Joe Chill. Yeah, You know, exactly. it's like, no, it's important for it to be Joe Chill because it needs to be random. Yeah, it, it I'm not even uh, sure. I think Joe Chill's the best guy because once you know it's Joe Chill, I think it's best if it's, I think it's best if it's Meth Head Larry, who freaking you know well, wants well, some freaking I, money. I mean, they retconned that in the '90s for a while that you know he, it, you know, Batman thought it was Joe Chill, but then like, yeah. you know, looking into it, he's like, wait a minute, it couldn't have been Joe Chill. So it's like, yeah, it was like completely random. So it's like, you know. That that will give him a reason, Batman, the reason the war on criminals for the rest of his life. Because he's like, yeah. I don't know who it was. You know, maybe they, maybe I got him, maybe I didn't. You know, yeah. Or maybe he just convinced himself so that he could continue to beat up on mentally ill people. Um, <laughs> you know, because he, because you know, if he wanted to thwart crime in Gotham, he could maybe create jobs in Gotham. Aren't these billionaires supposed to be the job creators? He could create a few jobs. The city's corrupt. They won't let him create jobs. Yeah, sure. No, no. They'll let him create jobs. They just want a piece. Well, yeah. They want him to trickle down on them. And that's what, that's, what makes, that's what makes him mad. Because he doesn't want to have to spend extra. Well, do you, he do, wants you to, do you want to line the pockets of like an Oswald Cobblepot? It'll probably take that money and like put more guns on the street or I don't know if, 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 uh, if Joe chill jr. Gets a job out of the deal and doesn't turn to a life of crime, maybe it's worth it. You so know? It's, it's worth it. It's worth it to give a guy a job. If like me, mom penguins giving people guns that kill more people. Well, why is penguin going to give people guns? Oh, penguin wants his money. Weren't you paying attention last night? He wants to sell those licenses. Yeah, not he didn't sell guns, he sold licenses. Yeah, but if someone he says said, and and he controlled the amount of licenses so he could show how crime was decreasing. And that was the point is that he was saying we're going to have organized crime. Which means that, you know, all crimes will be approved. And he basically created the guild of a calamitous intent. Mm-hmm. And he basically was which was this idea that, you know, what if we, you know, that that these idiots running around with laser beams, or in this case, guns, is dangerous. Well, here's... So let's create a system in which they can operate and do their craziness, but in a safe and orderly manner. Well, that's the next step. 
you know, you buy your license, you got to buy your guns from Penguin too, because that way, if he has all the serial numbers on foul, if you go off off the reservation, he knows exactly who's, you know. Okay, so he's making money on it too, but but that doesn't <laughs> that does that, 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 But my point is is that first I know. off, you know, first off, if he's supposed to, let me put it this way: he trashes a, a billion dollar bat plane every movie. Okay. You know, he's always, he's like, he is tearing this stuff apart and just like it meaningless, throwing batterings around like they're going out of style. The man is not responsible with his money. The money, the amount of money he invests in a batarang probably could send freaking Robin to college instead of putting Robin on a rooftop. Well, I mean, you imagine that world for one minute with Robin and Tim Drake and. That other one, like, just went to college well, and Dick, didn't become Robin. Dick, Grace, Dick Grayson went and just like Dick Grayson went to college, and uh, you know, well, Jason Todd died before before he could go to college, and yeah, yeah, Be, because Batman said, you know, it's important that you also fight criminals as well as actually make a life for yourself. Because my thing is, we got to do what I want to do. Hey, hey. You're always He's talking about as Alfred. You're always talking about Batman beating on mentally ill people. Who says Batman's sane? That doesn't make it right. No, but I'm just saying. I mean, you know, you Batman like is. You know, Batman is uh, the Mad King Ludwig of uh, the DC universe. Uh, you know, Mad King Ludwig, the guy who built all the fairy tale castles. Basically, like a lot of royalty. Um, of uh the 1700s he you know he had pretty severe mercury and lead poisoning and that led to diabolical schizophrenia and uh mad king ludwig would occasionally have to murder someone and he would like shoot at a peasant and his servants would bring him a gun and a peasant would walk out and he would shoot him and the peasant would fall down and but what it was was actually that they realized that he needed to had the urge to kill so he would um they would give him a gun that just had powder and no shot, and they, he would shoot at the peasant that they cued, and the peasant would fall down. And he said, now the urge to kill has passed. Hmm. At least that's the urban legend. You never heard of Mad King Ludwig? I don't know. I don't think I have. Oh, he's like up there with Emperor Norton. You do know who Emperor Norton is, right? Uh, yeah, bang, zoom to the moon. No, Emperor Norton. The Emperor of the United States of America and all, uh, and all, uh, no, I'm sorry, actually, I believe it was the Emperor of North America and, um, or possibly just the US. I'm not sure. Uh, it was the Emperor of America, I lived in San Francisco in uh, the early 1800s and basically declared himself Emperor and minted his own currency and did all this stuff. And the people of San Francisco, who loved a eccentric at the time, went along with it. Uh, and Alan Moore did a whole thing, or no, no, Neil Gaiman did a whole thing about him in uh, in the Sandman series. So what? So another one of these lunatics who gives themselves their own honorific? Is that what yeah. you're talking about, Professor? Basically, yeah, he is. Yeah. He is my inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> Meaningless honorifics, man. That's what it's all about. Okay, Phil. Is there anything else to talk about? No, I think we've run the gamut tonight. I think we have, from Nazis to Emperor Norton. From Nazis to Norton. It's your one-stop shop here at Super Connectivity. And it all flowed beautifully because it was all super connected. Okay, Phil, if people would like to reach you and talk to you about uh, Norton and Nazis, where can they do so? Uh, well, if you want to get a hold of us, if you, especially if you're a creator and you'd like to do an interview like David F. Walker did last episode, you could... Uh, it was so cool! Yeah, email me, nightwingpdp at gmail.com. Find me on Twitter. I'm going to be doing more live tweeting now. The shows are coming back, uh, at nightwingpdp. And uh, any thoughts, you can use our the Capes and Lunatics voicemail for any of our stuff, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And keep your eye out, October Saturday, October 7th, this show and all the Capes and Lunatics shows and other people are going to be part of our uh, online marathon in if you're a company. Uh, if you have any advertising needs, uh, get a hold of me or Rob Southgate because we can help you. We will shill for you. That's right.
Unless you're Nazis. We don't show for Nazis. That's right. That's our line. <laughs> That's our only line. Okay. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to write to me in the old fashioned email ways or Miles and Paz once did, you can do so at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's super connectivity blog, all one word at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on the Twitter that says I tweet Gotham and Legends of Tomorrow and the Inhumans and all the many wonderful television programs that we can now watch together. At Charlie Esser, that's C H A R L I E E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. Thank you for connecting with us once again. Ladies and gentlemen, please super connect with us once again. Good night. Now we come up to the connectivity when we dance. Now we dance. Don't touch the monkey. Surprised Michael Myers never did a Dieter a Dieter movie. Although he actually probably did, and it was like one of those straight-to-video ones, like the Pat movie.